In DC, for DC. DC Radio, 96.3 HD4 and DCRadio.gov. Welcome to another edition of Champagne and Credit right here on DCRadio.gov at 96.3 HD4. And hey, it's a new year. And we know we're going to start the new year off with Muriel and Shahida. All right. Joining me in the studio today is Shahida Williams of Shahida Speaks, a phenomenal black woman in her own right. She's done everything from banking to law. She speaks multiple languages, but at the core of who she is, it's about helping individuals be the best that they can be, particularly in the space of money. And I am really excited that she is like my sidekick today. Hey, Shahida, how, how are you are doing? You? Oh, I'm great, and I'm so happy to be here, Muriel. Um, here to discuss lots of interesting things. You're right, I'm the proprietor of Shahida Speaks, which is a public speaking venture. And uh, among other things, we talk about financial topics. We get people motivated to set new financial goals. We get people interesting and in pulling out those budgets and really taking a second look at them and trying to win for 2020. So you started Shahida Speaks. I have. And I know when we talked about bringing you in, because you you are a hard woman to, to, to actually pin down, I said we wanted to talk about financial goals, but we're going to talk about a lot of things in a little bit of time, so let's just dive into it. All right. When we're talking about financial goals, why is it important to set goals? Well... I live in another world, as I'm sure you do, right? And so I could come up here with platitudes and so forth, but you know, it's gonna, drama's gonna happen. And so we have to save for a rainy day. And, have, and setting goals, what that does is it sets us on an upward trajectory while things are happening so that we can make regular and methodic efforts towards success. And then those rainy days are just minor setbacks and tell a good story when we achieve success, right? Oh my goodness, I like the way you put that. <laughs> <laughs> so that means, you know, when people say setting goals and the other thing that generally comes out of the mouth of those that are teaching people all the things that they did wrong about money mm. is this thing about a budget. Right. Right. A budget is a central tool. Now, we think of book goals and budgets as esoteric things, right? They're just something that we're supposed to do to seem like good people. But actually, they're essential tools. You wouldn't build a house without a hammer. You can't be financially successful without a budget. So you have to have some sort of mechanism that tells your money where to go and can account for it later so that you can measure success. And that is just really at the core of it. I don't care if you write it on a napkin, if you have a fancy Excel spreadsheet or anything in between. The main point is that those two objectives are met. Where is the money going and how did it get there? And then being able to analyze along the way to make corrections as we go along. So it's not something that you've got to stick to. It's just something that puts you in control. Well, the stick to itness is the goal part, right? So okay. you set those goals and that's kind of the, the nails versus the hammer, right? So you need both to like, you know, build the structure. But if I don't, if I miss, you know, if my budget says X and my life says Y, what does that say about me? That means that you're not striking the nail on the head, right? That's what that means. And many people, I think what you're describing, in the academic world, we would say that, you know, your, your goals are divergent, right, from your <laughs> actions. And that doesn't make any sense, right? So you want to, you know, get out of debt and save money, but you, your, your real goal is to go to Tahiti for the summer. Well, those two things don't match because Tahiti is going to cost money. And that frustrates your ability to save and get out of debt. So you really have to get real about what you want and not what you think other people want for you. And that's hard. That's really hard because I've been in a lot of financial education <laughs> classes. And what I hear is, well, you should do this and you should do this. Very prescriptive. And it's, it doesn't relate to anything that's going on in my real life. So how do I put on the right filters to be able to get the best out of this information? Well, one of the things that we, you know, we do over at Shada Speaks is when we approach this topic is we don't make people feel bad about what they value. Okay. We'll challenge you about what you value. Do you really value that? Is that really what you want? But if what you want is to have the most exclusive shoe collection, you know, among your friends, who am I to tell you not to do that? And when you leave my workshop, it's probably what you're going to do anyway. So instead of that, we show you how to put a powerful plan in place that aligns your goals with your money. And then if the two don't match up, now you got some hard questions to ask yourself. 
Is this really where I can go? I got to either cut something out or I got to find a way to make more money to make the goal happen. But you see how the analysis is happening? And that's the most powerful part of budgeting, I think. Well, I've noticed in the first five or six minutes that we've spoken uh, about this topic, you've not used two words. And those two words are needs and wants. And everybody that I've brought in on this show, those two words are the cornerstone of everything they talk about. Hmm. Why is it that you don't use those two words? Because I think they're highly subjective, meaning I think that they depend on the individual's values. And I think, again, that's what sets what I do apart from other practitioners and where we tend to disagree, which is okay. But, you know, a need is something you have to survive where you're at, right? I mean, in, in general. But instead of telling you what I, what you need, I'll tell you what the definition is and you decide. So again, some people th- may think that they need an awesome shoe collection. The problem is, is if the numbers don't match the, you know, the, the definition, now you got a problem because you got nice shoes, but no gas or lights, right? Mm. So I let you draw the conclusion rather than draw it for you, because I'm not in your pocket or purse when you make those financial decisions, right? (laughs) You got to be capable. And then wants, wants are endless, right? Especially today. I mean, just listening to the radio on the way in, I wanted three things (laughs) that I didn't know I wanted. Because the advertiser (laughs) did a great job of just putting that seed in your mind and giving giving you that visual. And so all 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 of a sudden, there was a sense of urgency agency for you to go out and get something. And for a lot of people, that means going into debt. Right. And it brings to mind, a, you know, a, a platitude that my dad used to use all the time. And now that I'm older, I understand. I'm not even sure who said it, but he used to say, you know, Shaida, you know, um, advertising is the art of extracting a dollar from a man's pocket without resorting to violence. Okay. And I used to think like, what does that mean? <laughs> And I, a great I have to, been robbed. It's a great way to be robbed. <laughs> and we are being robbed every Christmas and every holiday that we think that the way to achieve happiness and togetherness with our family is through consumption. Kids need your presence, not your presence, right? Okay. All right. Well, you know, we're in a current economic environment where interest rates are at an all-time low. mm And as a result of that, consumers are now seeing, you know, it used to be back in the day, I'm going to date myself, it was how many credit applications you received in the mail when you came home. Now it's how many credit applications you receive on your email or on your your cell phone. Mm. And they're just going crazy. Right. It's... It's ma- it's maddening and and it's I mean it's almost unfair because along with the budget and the financial goals I mean we're expecting people nowadays to be even more sophisticated the products are just bombarding you with all these sophisticated um, you know offers and it's just really hard to discern what is and is not a good deal so you know the marketing is not helpful in that regard but do you think that we are really those those of us that are in the business of money do you think that we're really expecting the consumer to be more sophisticated? Or do you think that we are just doing our business in the business of money, which is money makes money? And the whole goal of money is to make money. And particularly since the cost of money is so low, we're going to create opportunities for the consumer to actually use more money so that we can make more money. Yeah, but what's subsumed in the contract between a borrower and a lender, I'm sorry, I'm putting on my legal yeah, hat here, your legal, is like, okay, equal bargaining work. power. And equal bargaining power implies that both people have requisite knowledge f- to bargain, right? They understand Should what they're yeah, buying. That is not what is happening in the consumer. Precisely. Girl, you, but, but that's you, what you're suggesting. Girl, you, you know good well that the consumer is clueless. Right, which is, and that goes to the point of sophistication, is that while sophistication isn't necessary, right, we make convenience in the marketplace, financial services, they make it easy to apply, to participate, to um, to buy and sell, but what they, but have a problem, right? Have an issue, try to get money from here to there, and you've never done that before. And, you know, all, and now you can reveal some of the complexities with, that undergird the contracts that you find yourself in, and that is problematic, and we put the onus on the buyer. And that's the way that unfortunately, you know, that's American Jewish prudence, well, capitalism, but American Jewish prudence is, is built on. You've probably heard the expression caveat emptor, right? Yes. Let the buyer beware, beware. right? So the buyer, 
is even has even more of a burden to scrutinize what he or she is buying before they buy it. And, and unfortunately, as a practitioner, I end up telling people that more often than I feel comfortable with. But that's just the reality. So, yes, we do require sophistication and it's just not there yet. So. The magic three numbers. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I'm not talking about the weight on the scale, but you know those other three numbers. I do know where you're going with this, I think. <laughs> that determine our value. Uh-oh. Because for many people, that three-digit number, i.e. their score, says a lot about who they are. You think? Oh, my goodness. Have you not been sitting in a brag session where people can brag brag about, well, this is what my score is, and I was able to buy this, and I was able to get that? You know what I do to people like that? I bring my bank statement, and I brag about how much cash I got on hand. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different, so you have a different way of looking at I it. I do. You don't feel that the credit score determines your worth. Well, remember my analogy earlier about the hammer and the nail, the budget and the goals, right? Well, consider credit as the screwdriver. I mean, I wouldn't show up to build a house. I mean, I've never done it. But I don't think I would build a house without a screwdriver. It just seems like a tool I should have. But it's not the only tool that I need. And the problem is because credit is so central to buying and leveraging the things, the big things, the important things, the cars, the houses, and so forth, that we can get to the point of obsession with that number to the point that we think that that number gives us value, when that is just a mistake. That's just a mistaken way to look at it. What is value? It's money in the bank. It's assets under ownership, right? It is not a credit score. That gives you access to those things. But if you obsess about it, those are my people that landslide right into debt. Because really, the, the credit score is only designed to give you access to borrow money, right? Well, it, it basically only shows how well you've managed debt. It doesn't say anything about how well you've accumulated cash. Precisely. But that figure is designed to show whether or not you should be eligible based on your past reputation, as you mentioned, right, to borrow more money. Mm -hmm. Is that where we want to be? Or do we want to be stacking cash? Do we want to be acquiring assets? Which one do you think... In our goals, if we're talking about financial goals, which one do you think should be in our minds? This is a challenge question. It's not a value question. You you can decide which one. Would you rather have the cash on hand or borrow the money? But in our communities, particularly in communities of color, they're not encouraging us to stack up cash. Which is precisely the problem. The problem with payday lenders and, and all of the um, alternative financial services is not really that they're predatory by nature. It's that they're seeking to solve a problem that really can only be solved with more money. Do you right? think they're really seeking to solve a problem, or do you think that they're just pimping us out in our current state? Yikes. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so, so you're talking also to someone who believes that alternative financial services do have their place in the market, right? I have worked with people who are of low income and vulnerable communities, and check cashing for them and payday lending for them makes sense. What we need to do is figure out a way to make it less burdensome, to make it less uh, expensive for them to borrow and use those services. But they're absolutely essential to a unsophisticated or low or moderate income uh, borrower. I don't, you know, so I'm going to have to come back, at, come back at you on that because you said that they make sense because they're essential tools in order for them to actually achieve their economic goals. But the only reason why they are present in those neighborhoods is because the other entities are not. Well, yes. Th yes so and no. So that makes them victims. Well, I don't know. I think it's a chicken or the egg scenario. I well, think how, if, well, how is it a chicken or the egg? I don't because know if you've ever talked to someone <laughs> who has used a check cashing service, but to them it makes quite a, quite a bit of sense. They they are bank averse, and I know you're used to, you've, you've, you've worked I've with people who are I've bank averse. I've talked to them. I know they use those alternative they services. They don't trust banks. And they don't trust banks, but at the same time, they work very hard for their money. Absolutely. And if the bank just like let's just let's let's take bank out of it. Let's just use another uh, credit unapp union. Well, let's not even use the financial sector. If a if two individuals have had negative experiences in friendship, 
Mm. Then in order for them to actually be able to move to a point of friendship, there has to be work on both sides to actually create this element of trust. Agreed. So money is 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 this tool of exchange should be between, let's just say, two friends. There has to be a degree of trust. I see you frowning at me. I, I, I see the attorney in you coming on out. <laughs> but there has to be this degree of trust in order to want to interact with you. Now, if historically you the, the trust has been eroded because you took from X or I thought you were going to do Y and then when it was time to consummate the agreement, it turned into something else and you didn't fully explain it to me, then that erodes my trust. Yes, but you also have to understand that um, to put financial, uh, traditional financial services, banks and credit unions back into the scenario, the problem is back to the sophistication issue. What you what, what I think is lost sometimes on practitioners what is sophistication the sophistication with yes I, I got to stop you because in my communities are our communities I, oh, yes in our communities yes ma'am our churches Genesis to Revelation liquor stores Ripple to Cavassier. <laughs> Hair stores, that weave to the $200 weave, there is a degree of sophistication and intellect that greatly exceeds that in other communities. Agreed. Perhaps you're conflating sophistication with intelligence, and I'm not. I'm not saying that the people who consume alternative financial services are not intelligent. I am saying that Consider this example, and this actually was uh, kind of the way it was explained to me by someone who, um, you know, frequents a check casher. I'm like, why would you use a check casher? A bank is free. And he said, look, if I go to the bank and make a deposit, they're going to put a hold on my check. Now, I already don't make that much money, but they're going to put a hold on my check. They're going to have me read an agreement, and I'm not quite sure what it all says because, you know, I went to high school. I'm good with my hands, right? And But, I, you know, I can't read this contract. I'm not even sure what it means. And, and as a sidebar, um, I have legal training, and I'm not sure sometimes what those <laughs> contracts mean. But, so, again, we're not talking about unintelligence. And then they're going to hold my check. I'm going to, you know, write checks or use my card against that, that money that I think is my money. I'm not sure when it's going to to be available because I'm out, you know, raising my kids and doing my business. And then they hit me with the fee and I don't understand how I got the fee. And then now I owe the fee plus I still have the bills. Whereas if I go to a check casher, that fee is up front. I walk out the door with my money. There's no surprises. There's no contract to read. Mr. Check Casher says, give me 1%. And I say, okay. And that premium that I pay is worth the peace of mind of knowing that when I walk out of that store, what's in my hand is what I got. I don't think that that's unintelligent at all. I think that's a very rational position. I don't think that lacks sophistication. I think that I speaks don't, to a lack of trust. Well, I think that that's a basic transaction as well, meaning... It's sophisticated in so far as you know how some of our clients, you know, they have sweep accounts and you know all these different uh, types of merchant accounts and and different types of investments. We have sweep accounts in the hood. It's called the cookie jar, the Bible, and the bra. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right? what it's called. I think we're two sides of the same coin, Muriel. I'm not so sure we're not both <laughs> defending the same our our same community. I think that what needs to happen. So I, you know. There needs to be access, but mm -hmm. I would not say, I, I would not say that the alternative services are there to, I, the alternative services are there because the other service providers decided they didn't want to be there. I'm not so sure. Well, listen, you talked earlier about because, dollars and cents, cause right? Because there's money to be made. There's a whole lot of money made have you done the analysis? There's a whole lot of money made in underserved. There's a whole lot of money exchanging hands in underserved communities. Uh, sure. A whole lot. Sure. And as a matter of fact, in underserved communities, they're more likely to pay higher fees than the other communities where they're going to negotiate you to death. Sure. I think that um, 
my analysis would run the risk of sounding like I'm defending check cashers. <laughs> I'm not. So let me be really clear. What I think is that you don't help communities, especially those who are vulnerable, by taking away choices. I, I think you help you. them by giving them choices. So where we can agree is, yes, we do need more traditional services, banks, credit unions that can be of service. We also need alternative services that can provide very simple, clean, linear transactions, but then we do need them to come down on the price. So perhaps we got in the weeds there, but I, I want you to know that my position is, you know, free, cheap, low cost, wherever is possible. Okay. Okay. But we can't be prescriptive, which is my point. We can't assume, and I think it's subsumed when we tell people, don't go to the check casher, that we're assuming that they can't make a rational choice. And based on my example with, we'll call him John, that is an absolutely rational choice for him, right? So be careful. We sometimes can, um, can, can patronize the very people that we intend to help. So maybe our difference is in style, Right. And perspective and not necessarily in, in heart. I, I, I will agree with you there. OK, there you go. You sound like it's, it's reminding me of a conversation I had with Marion Barry when he would say to me, he'd look across the table and he'd say, you're criticizing the victim. So there's that, right? So I'm glad to be associated and remind you of the great Marion Barry. I think he had some phenomenal public policies, right? So... I'm thrilled and flattered that I'm putting you in that same that category. That you're putting me in that same category. If I can honor the legacy of the great late Marion Barry, then, you know, I'm on the right track. I'd have to say that you definitely are. So back to the three numbers. Uh-oh. So FICO, mm -hmm. Fear Isaac, uh, came up, announced early in 2020 that they're going to change their score model. And we all know that... Credit scores are used to determine how much people are going to pay for the privilege of borrowing someone else's money. Right. But in their change of the model, it's going to really adversely impact individuals who had learned how to basically manipulate the score process. You know, they ran up their credit cards and they went out and got a personal loan to pay off their credit cards. So they paid off their credit cards, they got the personal loan, so they've got this available credit that's now gone up, which has a huge impact on their score. Their score has gone up, and so which impacts their ability to get more money because hopefully their price for cash or their price for debt is going to be less because their score is higher. But now with this change with, I think, FICO Model 10, these same people are going to see a huge hit. Could be 20 to, 20 to 30 points or so. Yeah, I heard about that. read a little bit about it. I, I can't say I'm on the expert level yet. It just kind of the news kind of rattled me as well. But again, back to my tool analogy, I'm not so rattled. And when I talk to um, potential clients, when I talk to audiences, I always explain, ask them when they start going down this rabbit hole of how this is going to impact their ability to borrow and so on and so, I ask them a simple question. Okay, tell me about your budget. Where's your cash at? Because if you're worried about borrowing, then you probably don't have any cash or you probably haven't done a good job of managing your cash. I don't know. I think I don't see this credit score in the center of the room. I see it as, a, as, a, as among tools. I see my budget in the center of the room. I see my cash in the center of the room. That's where I live. All the shell game about borrowing money and interest rates and all that, I don't know. That's a, that's a debtor's game. But that's the game that the average consumer has been taught to play. Precisely. And your statement is very powerful. They've been taught to play it. By whom? I mean, I think one of the most argumentative statements I've ever made among practitioners is the idea that a person who is financially literate and a person who's a good candidate from a, for a bank are mutually exclusive. They are not the same, right? And even as a, in, in, you know, looking at it from a legal perspective, some of the things that a bank would ask someone to, to do to be a good candidate for a loan are things I would probably vehemently recommend they not do, like make personal guarantees and, and um, you know, put up certain collateral. But that, 
that's what that's what these classes are. If you go to a lot of financial literacy classes, they are really um, just kind of, you know, a proxy for here's how to do a bank application for a loan. And they become conduits to for lenders and credit opportunities and credits. Ultimate result. Debt. Debt. So forgive me for kind of moving a little bit away from your direct question about the impact of credit scores, because mine's going to be impacted, too, of course. Right. But again, I think if you're going to be a player in 2020, if you're going to be financially successful, if you're going on an upper trajectory, you're worried about cash and building assets and you're trying to get out of debt. The debtor is slave. To right to the lender, absolutely. So that is a huge problem. Reprogramming, getting people to kind of think a little bit differently, challenging those assertions. Now, if you walk away that your credit score is in the center of the room, you know, more power to you, because so there are we, going to be some impacts. So, how do we go about that reprogramming? I mean, we're we're coming up on you know we've got roughly four minutes left. Mm. So, because you call it programming, I call it brainwash. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> it sounds more purposeful when you put it that way. <laughs> well, the whole purpose of money is to make money, and money makes money off of interest and fees. If people don't go into debt, then money will not make money and grow at the rate that it needs to grow for those who in the who are in the business of money need it to grow in order to pay their shareholders and their investors. Boom! Right. And these are the people that are teaching financial education in the marketplace, right? So how do we empower the consumer? What knowledge should the consumer have in order for them to understand the game and play the game to their advantage? Well, I think understanding credit is powerful. So let me just make sure I stay that and stay close to that position because my um, aversion to to debt and the debt game is um, does not mean that credit is not a tool. But I think we come back to the first question, which is goal setting. What do you really want, Muriel? And it's so funny. The older I get, the longer I live, the more I realize how difficult and unfair that question really is, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have all these bombardments. We have um, our, you know, our family values. We have societal pressures. We have our religious convictions. We have all of these different things culminating and and kind of noise in the background of pulling us in all these different divergent directions. But at some point, we have to calm that and say, what do I want and what do I want my money to do? And whatever that is, as practitioners, we can't necessarily be judgmental. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we have to give people the tools to practice. My grandparents can budget their money to the penny. And you know why? Because they got 60 years of practice. Okay. Right? And so I'm not saying you need that much to be that successful, but that's what they point to when I ask. So I would just say practice. Uh, getting people um, interested in self-educating versus relying on banks and financial institutions to educate them, right, on how to be good customers for them. That seems very peculiar. And um, really just making goals and the budget central to everything that you do financial. Those are some great tips. I think. So we're at the end of the show. Mm. This went by really fast. It did. So how can our listeners find out where you're going to be, what you're going to do, where you're doing it next? How can they track what's going on with Shahida Speaks? Well, they can. Well, I love questions and comments. So if people have questions or comments, you can follow me at Shahida Speaks. At, I mean, you can email me at ShahidaSpeaks at gmail.com. Shahida is spelled S-H-A-H-I-D-A-H. Speaks is S-P-E-A-K-S at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram, both at Shahida speaks. Those are my Twitter and my Instagram handle. So I tweet and, and um, you know, where I'm going to be and who I'm going to be teaching next. And, you know, I'd love for you to follow me and I'd love to follow you. Well, you know, I told you at the beginning, we talked about this last year. Mm. You know, we're, we're out of time. But you followed your goals. You set up your business. You're now doing the darn thing. Absolutely. So I am looking forward to you coming and sharing the table with me at least once a month. Well, let's make it happen. We're going to be doing that. You've been listening to Champagne and Credit Pathway to the Middle Class right here on DCRadio.gov at 96.3 HD4. Joining us in the studio today was the one and only Shahida Williams of Shahida Speaks. Follow her. 
learn from her and grow your finances. Thanks for listening and have a great day. In D.C., for D.C., D.C. Radio, 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov.